What's up, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Believe in Falcons. I'm your host, Will McFadden. We are going to be digging into the linebackers today for the Atlanta Falcons, a group that kind of gets overlooked, I think, when we talk about the defense, or maybe certainly by me, because I've paid so much attention to the secondary over the last season, what they were able to do, bringing in one of my favorite guys of the offseason, uh, Jeff Okuda. That didn't necessarily pan out, but Jesse Bates did in every single way imaginable. And then when you look at what the future could hold, I'm fascinated by this front seven and just how could things change. It's almost like a little bit of a, an island of misfit toys this past year with guys on one-year deals who maybe hadn't popped anywhere else at a super high level. Then you bring in Father Time himself with Calais Campbell, and he just continues to play like the ageless wonder. So it's really easy to overlook the linebackers for Atlanta, but we shouldn't because they may be one of the most effective groups on this defense when you look at just the contribution levels of the guys named or of the guys who played relative to the name value of, you know, a Caden Ellis or a Nate Landman. And, you know, Troy Anderson, we didn't really get to see him, but that doesn't mean that I don't still have very high hopes for what the future could hold. So we are going to be digging into the linebacker group today for Atlanta. Not going to be as long as some of the other episodes just because, you know, there's not that many players to talk about here. But it is going to be a very fun group that we are going to get into. So if you have missed our interior defensive line conversation or our edge group conversation, I recommend going and uh, checking those out after you listen to this one. They don't have to be done in any sequential order. So let's go ahead and get into our linebacker conversation. But first, Bet Online continues to be the number one source for all your basketball wagering needs, including pro and college hoops throughout the year. With up-to-the-minute odds, stats, and trends, you can follow your favorite team's path to the playoffs with in-game live betting, contests, and all the best player props. Experience the world's best wagering platform anytime from your desktop or mobile devices. So head to BetOnline today to become part of the team, and remember to use our promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. BetOnline, the game starts here. We've got a great new sponsor that I am excited to tell y'all about. I love betting my friends and betting them on anything, whether that's sports games or, yeah, I remember one time we were down at the varsity here in Atlanta, a couple of buddies, one bet another that, you know, they wouldn't ingest uh, the seasoning salts that go on the French fries down there at the varsity through, we'll just say the nasal passage. And it was enjoyed by all except for the person that actually had to do the bet. So if you're like me and you like betting on anything and everything, then let me tell you about Cut. The Cut app is a peer-to-peer -peer social betting platform that's legal in over 40 states. Cut has customizable odds, tracking capabilities, and an entire social network with group chats, user profiles, and rewards. I feel like that is really what sets it apart. And with all your payments, there is no need for Venmo. So. Whether you want to bet your friends on the next game or who can down the most hot wings, head over to Cut and be sure to use our promo code Believe Falcons. That's B L E A V Falcons for a ten percent welcome deposit bonus. Don't forget that promo code one more time. It is Believe Falcons B L E A V Falcons to get that deposit bonus. Cut. Put your money where your mouth is. All right, so Atlanta's linebackers, we're going to start with Caden Ellis, who was the headliner, a, an offseason acquisition from the New Orleans Saints. Caden Ellis was a really interesting test case because he was somebody who injuries really impacted the, the start of his career, but there were high hopes for him when he was initially drafted by the Saints and groomed a little bit to become this very versatile pass rushing linebacker who can kind of go all around the field. And it was here in Atlanta that that vision really came to fruition. He played all 17 games. He had 122 tackles, which were 20th amongst uh, all linebackers. He had 11 tackles for a loss, which were tied for 11th at the position. Four sacks tied for ninth among linebackers. 26 pressures, fifth among linebackers. So there's that pass rush potential that I was talking about. Three pass defenses tied for 21st among linebackers. And then a 75 PFF grade, which was 22nd among qualified linebackers for pro football focus. I mean, that's really, really good. If you're talking about a player that you acquired on, you know, not the biggest deal in the world to come in here and be your starter on the interior, 
Caden Ellis was all over the place for Atlanta and very consistent. I mean, he and Jesse Bates and Clayus Campbell and David Onyemata and Grady Jarrett, those guys are, you know, of course going to be really, really good at game in and game out. But they were consistent and really showed me because over the Dan Quinn era, you had these players who were awesome, right? Deion Jones, when he was locked in, I mean, I defy you to find me like five better players on a football field in a game that Deion Jones is playing when he is on. And we've, we've seen that time and again, whether it be the interception against Drew Brees, uh, their Mercedes-Benz Stadium that won the game for them, or the, that pick six his rookie year. I mean, I know I'm just mentioning Saints plays, but that's Deion Jones had awesome plays against the Saints. But it was also that he would be a black hole at times. And one game, you'd have an all-pro type of effort from Deion Jones, and the next, he's missing the gap and, and allowing a big leaky run play and things like that. What I learned this year and in, in watching these, these players like Caden Ellis is just the level of game in and game out consistency that you have to have, not just for individual success, but for team success. And that is what I think the Falcons really have prioritized recently over these last three years is a player who not just game in and game out, but like day in and day out. When you're in training camp, when you're in the middle of a season, when you're at the end of the season and maybe not going to reach the playoffs, the guys who are still going to do those little things that it takes to be successful. And to me, that is Caden Ellis. And so I'm not surprised to see him doing well in every facet of the game. I wasn't surprised to see him, you know, corralling running backs when everybody else on the defense had been fooled, knifing in to knock down the quarterback when every other pass rusher had been kind of stifled. And I'm excited to see Caden Ellis' continued growth because I do think he has better days ahead of him. As well as he played in his first year for Atlanta, I do think that he is capable of more. And so what does that look like? For the Falcons under a new defense with a, a new defensive staff, you know, some of the coaches are still going to be in place there, and that is certainly going to help with some of the continuity. But Caden Ellis is a nice piece for the Falcons. And I do think when we look back at whenever it may be, the Terry Fondo era, players like Caden Ellis should not get overlooked because, in a lot of ways, to me, this embodies what Terry Fondo does so well, which is find these guys who, again, the market may be overlooking or undervaluing and getting them in here on the right deal and then having their best ba- best days be ahead of them. Um, so I could probably go on for another 5-10 minutes about Caden Ellis. Really, really nice player. I, I'm impressed with what I saw from him and, and I think he's going to continue to do really nice things uh, for this defense. Nate Landman, man, <laughs> like everything copy and paste what I just said about Caden Ellis in terms of the undervaluing and the overproducing and just being on top of the details and game in and game out. I mean, how about Nate Landman? As an undrafted free agent in his second year, 16 games, 110 tackles, seven tackles for a loss, two sacks, one interception, three forced fumbles, which were fourth among all linebackers, three pass defenses, and a 72 PFF grade, which was 28th among all linebackers. So again, as an undrafted free agent, who I think a lot of people probably viewed as maybe like a Paul Warlow type of player, just a, I mean, with the name Nate Landman, you just think run defense, right? You're like, well, there's a downhill thumper who is going to just run to the A gap as hard as he can. And if the running back's not there, eh, he's probably not going to be too good at anything else. It's not the case. Nate Landman had a lot of range sideline to sideline. He had a freaking nose for the ball, like a bloodhound and rarely was missing tackles. I was so, so impressed with, just his ability and his reliability as a young player who does not have that much experience. But once Troy Anderson was down and and he stepped in, you could kind of tell the level of respect the coaching staff had for him already, the trust that his teammates had in him, and how well he worked with Caden Ellis. I mean, the neither of these guys, Caden Ellis or Nate Landman, are overly proficient in coverage. They're not the most athletic linebackers in the world. But the way they played together, their communication, the continuity between those two, I really do think um, ultimately had a huge impact on just the overall level of play for this Falcons defense, which was far and away the surprise unit for this Falcons team and the best unit for this Falcons team. 
Um, and Nate Lamon had as much of an impact on that as anybody else because he was not going into the year as the starter. He was the next man up, and he was the next man up very early on in game two. And the entire season, he earned the right to be a starter. So I don't know what the future will hold with Troy Anderson and Nate Landman and certainly now with the defense changing a little bit again. And it's not going to be a surprise at all to see the Falcons kind of run some one linebacker looks. That's a little bit of what Raheem Morris was doing in L.A., what you know Jimmy Lake and those guys were doing in L.A. is these like five man fronts with one linebacker and then your your nickel set in the back. So maybe that decreases some of these roles even more. But Nate Landman going to be an awesome special teams player if that's ultimately what his role shrinks back down to. And I think he's just an awesome linebacker whose better days are probably ahead of him. Um, so again, I can't really say enough nice things about what Nate Landman did in a really tricky spot for a team that really in year three was going for it. I mean, they were going, they had playoff aspirations and they put a lot into the defense this off season. You could have seen a world where that injury to Troy Anderson really derailed a lot of those plans and was a big setback for a unit that they were hoping would take a big step forward. Instead, they do take that big step forward. And it's because of the play of a guy like Nate Lamman, um, Andre Smith, who filled in during you know a few injuries to some guys uh, later in the year, but he played 11 games, ultimately 19 tackles, one forced fumble, one fumble recovery, one pass defense, a 77.1 PFF grade. And then Troy Anderson wrapping it up two games, as I mentioned, his stats in two games, I mean, show the type of impacts that he could have had if you extrapolate them out for a full season had he stayed healthy. But in two games, 19 tackles, which is as I mentioned, as many as Andre Smith had in 11 games. Um, One tackle for a loss, half a sack, only a 50.6 PFF grade. But again, that could be very volatile. He was missing a lot of tackles, which is a concern that I have for Troy Anderson. But the numbers in a very, very limited sample size do still speak to the upside that the former second round pick has. And again, he's only entering year three. One of those years derailed by injury. Kay Nellis knows a thing or two about that. So not a bad mentor to have in that room as somebody to lean on as you come back from injury and you're going through that rehab process and the mental side of the game and still learning for a young player. So don't count out Troy Anderson yet. He has the athleticism to be an incredible NFL linebacker. The lack of reps this past season, I do think will hurt. And it is something that if you had asked me going into the year, like who are the players that really need a lot of these reps, Troy Anderson would have been pretty high on that list, just given his background. Um, but he didn't get those. He now is going to be coming into a little bit of a defensive uh, scheme change. So curious to see how all of that shakes out. But the ball of clay with Troy Anderson is still up there among the very best to work with on this roster. So still have very high hopes. And even in that two game, really one and a half game sample size, you saw the flashes of why this team is excited about him and did take a chance on him in the second round as not a fully developmental prospect. Because again, like the the athletic numbers are there. You don't have to develop the athleticism. It is there. But I think you guys get my point. Um, So I mentioned Ellison Landon. They ranked 13th in tackles by linebacker duos. I, I did the full breakdown. I went like every single team and looked at their top two linebackers. I was surprised that they were only 13th, which speaks to the the talent at linebacker in this league and also, you know, how good these guys are just sideline to sideline racking up tackles. Like that's maybe why you're seeing the devaluation of the linebacker position is because it's not easy to get tackles, but like there are a lot of guys out there that can just get tackles. Foye Lewican, I mean, that dude is a tackle machine. He is so, so good and continues to be amazing in that stat. I want to say he led the league again this year with like 183 tackles. So he is really good. But Ellis and Landman were 13th in tackles. They had 232 combined tackles. So no slouch those two guys themselves. uh, Ellis ranked 15th in missed tackle percentage, which is good, right? So 15th best missed tackle percentage, only missing 7.2% of his tackle chances. And then Nate Landman ranked 9th in overall stops and stops are defined as the offense basically not having a successful play on that play because you stopped him. So 
There we go on on some of the notable stats and rankings. Uh, The players under contract for 2024, you have Caden Ellis, who is in year two of a three-year deal. He will be 29, which is older than I think a lot of people would expect. But again, he injuries kind of early on in the career. So he is a little bit older as he is starting to make his first real impact on the field. He will be $8.5 million against the cap, which is, you know, a a higher number, not the highest number in the world, um, but a little bit higher than some of the other numbers I've mentioned throughout this series. Troy Anderson, year three of his four-year rookie deal, he will be 25 years old, $1.6 million against the cap. So that is awesome. You got Milo Eifler, who will be 26 years old, $985,000 against the cap. Uh, he signed a reserve future contract. And then Donovan it's Mutant, uh, 24 years old. He also signed a reserve future contract uh, and will count $795,000 against the cap. The potential cap casualties, none. Even though Cade Nellis has a high uh, cap hit of $8.5 million, the math right there, like his savings are just not going to be very much. It's only year two of that three-year deal. So next offseason, you may be able to see that kind of cap relief if you decide to move on this year. It's just not going to be there. The math doesn't work. So I would expect Kate Nellis to continue to be on this roster, not only because he's an awesome player, but just again, the way that the deal is structured doesn't make sense to move on from any of these guys this offseason. The free agents for 2024, it's Nate Landman. Um, He believe it or not, is an exclusive restricted free agent, which just means that he has two or fewer accrued years of service in the NFL. He has two. um, An accrued service is basically a number, I think it's six games or so, that you have to appear in. And then you like that season counts as a season in the NFL for you. Um, But basically, the only thing the Falcons have to do to to keep him is make him a qualifying offer. And an exclusive uh, restricted free agent has to accept a qualifying offer that is made by the team. Um, they could, of course, sign him to a longer term deal and just get that done out of the way. But if they want to do a one year minimum qualifying offer, bring him back, they can do that as well. I would expect them to do that unless, again, they have bigger plans for Nate Landman moving forward and they want to go ahead and get him to like a four year deal relatively cheaply. If they think his best days are ahead and he has Pro Bowl potential, maybe it makes more sense to do that instead of another year of maybe great production from him, and then he's even more expensive next offseason. They have about $11.7 million invested at the linebacker position so far. Um, They rank 15th in terms of that money invested, but that also includes the edge position players that I just mentioned. So guys like Lorenzo Carter or Arnold Arnold Ebicady are technically listed under linebackers. Um, So even though they're 15th, The inside linebacker guys, they're probably much lower on that list because, again, they really only have Caden Ellis that they are paying in that group. Um, Free agents or draft picks to keep an eye on, I don't really think that they're going to be adding a ton to this group because, as I mentioned, they could be looking at a lot of one linebacker sets in this defense. And if that's the case, they almost have too many guys (laughs) to, to worry about here. But Drew Tranquil is maybe one guy who could fit that coverage ability that they're looking for because they don't really have a great, I think, coverage linebacker in this uh, on this roster right now. And in this defensive scheme, as you're rotating and changing a lot of things post-snap, it would behoove you to have a linebacker that could be showing blitz and then boom, drop into coverage. And, and you need a guy who is adept, can get back, maybe run a Tampa 2 type of linebacker, middle linebacker covering that deep middle I don't know if they have that guy or certainly a guy that it's very clear that their their strength is that coverage aspect. Could they add a player like that? Sure. Drew Tranquil is one name that I, I put down who could maybe be on the cheaper end if that's what you want to do. But I kind of think they have too many guys maybe in this position right now. So I don't think you're going to see them add a huge name to this group. They could, in the draft, add somebody day two, day three for special teams, for depth purposes, what have you, but it's not a huge priority on my list right now for the Falcons this offseason. So that's what I've got for you guys for the inside linebacker position evaluation for the Falcons. Uh, A group we don't talk about a lot, but a group I like a ton. And especially with Caden Ellis going into year two of this deal, 
You've got Troy Anderson, who really hasn't shown his full capabilities. And you've got Nate Landman, who can be had for, again, a minimum qualifying offer, come back on a one-year deal. He's now got a full season as a starter under his belt. Those three, awesome. Like I, I know that they're not all pro caliber guys or what have you, but when you're looking at investing resources at different spots in the roster, having a makeup of a group like this, where you do have a young ascending player who you can still feel optimistic about in Troy Anderson, maybe that right there is almost reason for you not to have to shake things too much because you're almost getting an addition simply by getting him back on the field. And that will give your defense an element and a flavor that it did not have last year. So that will do it for me today. As always, this episode was presented by Bet Online. We have a couple more of our defensive position outlook uh, series coming. We'll have cornerbacks and safeties next on the docket. So keep your eyes on this feed. We will have those coming shortly for you all. But until then, everybody, take care.